So happy to see each, <clears throat> each and every one of you today in our third session of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians was written by the apostle Paul under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we see that he ended chapter one by talking about God's great power in raising Jesus from the dead. And now, what are the implications of that resurrection power of Jesus uh, for our life? All right, let's start with chapter two. Though we have done these verses, I have some thoughts. Uh, so we're going to go back over them again. Um, I'm going to ask Toyin to read chapter two, verse one. Ephesians chapter two, verse one. And you have, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Yes. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Were is past tense, all right? You were dead in trespasses and sins. Though we are now alive, we must never forget where we came from. We were dead in trespasses and sins. This means we were spiritually dead, all right? The idea behind trespasses is we have crossed a line challenging God's boundaries. You know, when a person has their property, they put up a sign, no trespassing. That means this doesn't belong to you. Don't come across this line. All right. So um, trespasses in the spiritual sense then means we have crossed a line challenging challenging God's boundaries. The idea behind sins, all right, is we have missed the mark, all right? Here's the mark, but we've missed it no matter how hard we try. We've fallen from, uh, you know, it says all have sinned and come short, fallen short of the glory of God. Adam and Eve were created with the glory of God. They had the light of G, uh, the light of God surrounding them. That was a spiritual light. They were clothed with that. They had no human clothes, but when they sinned, they fell. They're no longer up there. They fell. And man has ever been trying to get up there by his own efforts to come again. So sins, the idea behind that is you have missed the mark, the perfect standards of God. There was a man called Stott, S-T-O-T-T, -T, all right, who wrote Concordance also. And in there, he said, in God's eyes, trespasses, we are a rebel. And in sins, we are a failure, all right? Um, let's jump to verse four, shall we? Would you read that for us? Um, yes. Verse four. Two, verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. All right. Um, this is God's motive in reconciliation. All right. God, who is rich or abounding in mercy, all right, or tender compassion, all right, wherewith he loved us. It's because of his great love, because of his great mercy. Mercy is really tender kindness, uh, tender love, all right, that when we should be punished, he gives us love instead, all right, but definitely mercy brings out that idea that we deserve to be punished, all right? But instead of giving us punishment, giving us what we deserve, he gives us his love. Um, he's rich in mercy. He's abounding in um, this loving kindness, the tender compassions. 
It's not just as he has a little bit, it overflows in his life. And every time I think about it, I want to start crying when I think how many times I really deserve to be punished by God, but he didn't punish me. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs, praise the Lord, and yours also, all right? So read four and five together, would you? I know you just read four, but I want five, but I don't want to read five by itself. So four and five. Okay. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, ye are saved. All right. So it says, because of his great love for us, all right, even, you know, sometimes we just can skim over that. I've underlined it on my notes and I even bracketed it. Even when we were dead in sins, all right, um, he didn't wait for us to become lovable before he loved us. When we were dead in sins, and you know, when you're dead, naturally, the longer you're dead, the more stench there is, the more decay there is. Uh, so spiritually, the same. Even when he loved us so much, even when we were dead, no matter how long we've been dead in our sins, he quickened us. He made us alive, all right? He put life into us, but it's together with Christ, not on our own. He didn't do it, find me here and put the life in me. It's when he put me into Jesus, when he took me and literally created me a brand new being, all right? So it's together with Jesus, all right? And then it puts in brackets there, by grace, you are saved. By grace. Remember, I know it's something we don't deserve, but what is grace? By God's life, by God's ability, by God's power, we are saved. Amen. We absolutely did nothing. We did not deserve it. We were not able to do anything. Spiritually, we were dead. There was nothing we could do, all right? He did it all. It's by grace. We didn't deserve any of it, all right? By grace, you, you are saved, all right? Um, verse 6. Verse 6. <clears throat> and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All right. Um, I'm going to, if you have your books on ex, the one called Explore the Book, I'm going to read from there, all right, uh, page 172, all right, uh, the very first paragraph, all right. It says he not only Raised, uh, he not only um, gave us life, quickened us, put life in us, um, but in verse six, he raised us up. Again, it's together with Christ. So let, I'm going to read that first paragraph. Second, over against subjection to Satan, we now read that God has raised us up together with Christ. Verse six. Our Lord Jesus himself was not merely quickened or made alive, all right? He, in other words, he was in the tomb. Here he is lying flat on this slab of um, stone that was raised up, all right? His body tightly wound in grave clothes. And life is put into him. Now, he didn't just leave him there bound up with life in him. No, it says he made him, he raised him and visibly brought forth from the grave. Jesus was raised 
and visibly brought forth from the grave, which demonstrated his victory over Satan and his entrance upon a higher form of life. In fact, if you remember the story when Peter and John ran there to the tomb, uh, Pete, John got there first, but he just peeked in, but Peter rushed in there and you know they had the face bound with a separate napkin and then the body wound and bound like that. Now, they, he saw that face napkin folded together neatly and laying there, all right? So that came off first, but you know, the other had to also come off in order for him to get up. And even as like Lazarus of old, uh, Lazarus, it was really a miracle when he came forth from the grave, he, he came out totally wound up, all right, and, and he had to be jumping. And when he flipped off that um, place that he was laying, it was a miracle that he didn't land on his head and die again. He ended up landing on his feet, but coming out, hopping out because he was totally bound. You say, how do you know? Because Jesus turned and he said to the disciples, take, take those grave clothes off of him. He couldn't get out of them. But Jesus, when he was raised up, all right, his grave clothes came off of him and he came out from that uh, grave, all right, demonstrating his victory over Satan and his entrance upon a higher form of life. So it is with ourselves. Listen carefully. We are not only given new life, we are freed from the bondage of that old life. We are raised with one, that's with Jesus, who already has Satan under his feet, all right? We are not raised on our own. Remember Lazarus, he had to die again. He was not given a glorified body, all right? But you and I, in the realm of the spirit, we get what we get by being one with Christ. Whatever happened to Jesus, when we're put into Jesus, all of that happens to us at the same time. Doesn't matter when you are put into Jesus, whatever took place with Jesus becomes your past history. Amen. So um, the ability to rise up, all right, he shared in our death all right spiritual death so we could share with him in life amen raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places all right um this is our present position in christ is sitting together all right in christ we're sitting in heavenly places and remember, I told you, uh, we're using Watchman Nee's book, Sit, Walk, and Stand, all right? And until we really learn how to sit, when you're sitting, the weight is not upon yourself. It's not taking any effort from yourself, all right? Your legs are at rest. I'm sitting on a couch. Uh, it's quite different than when you're standing and teaching, standing and preaching. Your legs get tired. Sometimes they even go to sleep on you. But when you sit, uh, there's no effort on yourself at all. So it is, all right, we are sitting together. That's our present um, position in Christ, all right? We're not earth dwellers, but we are citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, Sister Toyin, read for us Philippians 3.20. Yes. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Yeah. Instead of conversation, our lifestyle, or another word for it is our citizenship is in heaven. All right. And we're looking, though we live here on earth, we're not earth dwellers. We haven't sunk our roots into this life. This is just temporary. There, there's a chorus that we used to sing when I was young, all right? This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, amen. I'm not settled down here. It, there's nothing in this life that is pulling me to stay here that I don't want to leave here. When it's my time to go, my citizenship is up there. Everything that I know and want and desire for eternity is there. And spiritually speaking, in Christ, I am sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. All right. I want you to notice here, it doesn't say um, sit with Christ. It says sitting in heavenly places in Christ. All right. Let's go back to Ephesians again, shall we? It says he raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places. Doesn't say with Christ. If it's with Christ, then he's here and I'm next to him. We're separate entities. No, no, no. He said he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I am in him. I am part of him. He and I are one. You and he are one. Therefore, we are all one in Christ. We're all part of Jesus if we have received him. Amen. Uh, now we're going to start with verse 7. That's really the verse we were to start with today because we covered the others. And yet I never uh, explained some of these things. And I thought we, we needed to. Let's go to verse 7, will you? Yes. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Yeah. That in the ages to come. All right. He's going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace, of his life, all right, in his kindness toward us. We just many times take it for granted. And I have found as I'm getting older and older and maybe getting closer to the time to see him face to face, I'm beginning to realize how little I appreciated it when I was younger. I just quoted verses and, oh, yeah, I'm this, oh, yeah, I'm that. But it, it never really gripped my heart the way it does now that I'm getting older. And the more I have begun to experience him, the more precious it is. And, and what it says is, in the ages to come, not just during our lifetime, but when we get there throughout the ages, we're, we're going to be seen right everything he has done for us his riches is the knowledge of jesus is unsearchable that we will not know everything it will be constantly we'll be growing and understanding more and more even though it says when we see him we will be like him but there's some things about him that it's just over the ages god will keep showing us and causing us to realize more and more and more how great his kindness was to us. I'm thinking it's a silly illustration, but I haven't told it for ages and it just came. I know it's from the Lord. So I'm going to tell this illustration. Uh, you know, when I was a little girl, we didn't travel by airplane because I don't even know really if there were airplanes at that time or not. When I was a little girl, uh, we traveled by steamship. All right. And, and it took from China to America, maybe six weeks 
uh, on the steamship, all right? And um, people, like if we were coming from America back to Singapore, uh, in those days, oh, they would all come. Uh, I, I don't know about people who didn't know the Lord, but people who loved Jesus and had a church, the church family loved us, uh, my family, uh, the church that they belonged to, although they went here and there preaching in all the churches, but the home church, all right, uh, relatives, friends, they would all gather at the pier and at the dock to say goodbye to us, you know, so it'd be a huge crowd of people that had come. And many of them brought uh, gifts uh, for us kids. They, they were all kind of different snacks and eatables and so forth. Now, my mother wasn't foolish enough to just say, here it is, dive in. We probably would have been sick trying to eat all those sweets that came in. So she thanked them all. And, you know, it was taken up into the stateroom and put in the stateroom. And every day she would take out something and open it up. And then we would get to oh, yay, you know, and we dive in and enjoy it. And the next day, I wonder what mama's going to have for us tomorrow. But it was things that had been given, but we hadn't seen it. We didn't know what it was. And every day there was a new surprise. Now that story comes in far short of what heaven is going to be. But God has marvelous revelations for us. All right. And I want us to realize that. So verse eight. Again, he goes back to by grace. Would you read that for us? Yes. And read eight and nine together. Okay. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. So by grace, by God's life, by God's power, by God's ability, but through faith, all right? If you don't have faith, if you don't operate in faith, because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. But when it says through faith, and that it's talking about the even that faith, all right, that it takes, all right, is not of yourselves. I've told you before about the lady when I went and said, don't you want to put your faith in Jesus? She said, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to. No, no, no. When you really want to, and God sees that earnest desire that you want what you're hearing about, you really want it. He puts that faith in you. He gives that faith in you. That's a, it's a gift. When something is a gift, you don't pay for it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's just by by tsugeni. That means without any cost, it's given to you. All right. And so that's the way it is with faith. So it says by God's life, by grace, through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. All right. Uh, God gives that faith to us. And then verse nine says, it has nothing to do with our works. It's not of works. It's not how much you prayed. It's not how many hours you spent reading the Bible. It's not how much money did you give to the church. Those are all called works, all right? And if you're using those works to try to earn God's love and earn God's salvation, it's said, salvation is not of works righteousness is not given because of works you cannot buy salvation you can only believe what god has said all right and it says right there uh in verse nine not of works lest any man should boast you see we tend to want to glorify ourselves we tend to want to pat ourselves on the back. You know how come God chose me? Because I used to fast. And I read this. I did that. I, I, I. No, nobody is going to get to heaven boasting about how they got there in themselves. No one, no one, no one. 
because we could do nothing. We were, cre we were created a brand new creature in Christ. And it was only God who could do that. Amen. So verse 10, would you read that for us? Yes. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah. For we are his workmanship. It's like uh, you didn't do yourself. All right. Um, in fact, there's one, I think uh, the Jewish rendition of this, um, that word, his workmanship, his work of art, his work of art. He's the one that did the whole work. How he could take somebody that was a filthy sinner, a dirty sinner, not just dirty, but wicked and gross and terrible. I'm remembering one that this man, in fact, he was a Jew, if I'm not mistaken. He was an only child and uh, his parents were very busy. He was left on his own a lot and he became a serial killer, a serial killer of women. And they had a hard time tracking him down. He would leave um, hints at each time that he murdered somebody. Uh, it was almost like taunting them to be able to find him and locate him and convict him. But one day he was caught and one day he was convicted. And because of how many women he had murdered one after another, he was given how many life sentences he would never get out of prison, never get out of prison. Now, you know, somebody like that, that it, it's an addiction to kill an addiction that they, they can't stop themselves. But while he was in prison, he heard the good news of Jesus and he accepted Jesus and he was created a brand new person in Christ. Never existed before. When you're created, this is from just like God spoke the words and the worlds came into existence. They never existed before, but he spoke them into existence. You and I were sinners. We never were righteous people. And yet when we cry out to him, when we hear the good news and we long to have that in our life, just like that, he speaks us into existence. We become a brand new creation. We never lived before. He doesn't take the old and start working on the old. He takes us and he makes us a brand new creation in Christ. There is a story that I want to share with you here about this um, creating us a new creation. This is Wigglesworth from Smith Wigglesworth book, Ever Increasing Faith, I believe it's called. He says, one day I was preaching about the name of Jesus and there was a man leaning against a lamppost, listening. It took a lamppost to enable him to be able to stay, keep on his feet. We had finished our open air meeting and the man was still leaning against the post. So I asked him, are you sick? He showed me his hand and I saw beneath his coat, he had a silver handled dagger. He told me he was on his way to kill his unfaithful wife, but that he had heard me speaking about the power of the name of Jesus, and he could not get away. Uh, he said he just felt helpless. I said, get you down. And there on the square 
with people passing up and down, he got saved. I took him to my home and I put on him a new suit. I saw that there was something in that man that God could use. He said to me the next morning, God has revealed Jesus to me. I see that all has been laid upon Jesus. I lent him some money and he soon got together a wonderful little home. His faithless wife was living with another man, but he invited her back to the home that he had prepared for her. She came and where enmity and hatred had been before, the whole situation was transformed by love. God made that man a minister wherever he went. There is power in the name of Jesus everywhere. God can save to the uttermost. Now, let me tell you, that took more than just saying a prayer, a formality of saying a prayer. To change this drunkard completely, this man who was so filled with anger and hatred and murder was in his heart, and he had that silver handled dagger and he was on his way to commit murder but the word of god when he heard it he couldn't leave he just stopped there and after praying he no longer wanted to drink he was a changed man he went back to, with smiggles smith wigglesworth to his home and went to bed and in the night God revealed to him Jesus and what Jesus had done for him. Uh, that short sermonette that he had heard on the street corner there, God revealed himself to him. And he was a completely, totally changed man. All right. No more desire to murder and kill. No more pride and arrogance. All right. When he took that money that Smith loaned to him and renovated that home and made it wonderful and lovely and called his unfaithful wife to come, it wasn't, a he had no more desire to take revenge. He was a brand new creation like that had never happened before. And when she responded and came, there was love in that house on his part, no longer the anger and the animosity. So we can see what a wonderful, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, all right, 10. We didn't exist before we got into Jesus. What existed was that old me that we don't wanna go back and relate to. It's still, though it's on the cross, though God has judged it, as far as you and I are concerned, you have to reckon that it's dead. Don't go back and join up with it, with its thoughts, its ideas, its suggestions, because that's under bondage to Satan, all right? And so um, it says, he has, let me read that again, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Now, it's not by good works that we're saved, but once we become a new creation in Christ, now God wants us to walk in good works, all right? Um, it says, which God hath before ordained, we could say predestinated, all right? God hath before predestinated that we should walk in good works, not walk in the old works, not walk according to the flesh, but walk now in good works, in love, in kindness, in forgiveness, in seeing beyond people's faults, seeing their needs and meeting those needs, all right? Um, Verse 11. Verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past 
Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. All right, continue reading. Yes. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay, all right, that's good enough. So that's telling. So what is it saying here? Remember, all right, in times past, all right, it's good for us to remember. It's good to remember where we came from and not just act like we've always been this new person. Um, because when you just start, taking in without bringing God into the equation that there can easily come spiritual pride. Oh, I've been a Christian for 10 years. I've been a believer now for 25 years. I, 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 the I is always wanting to come up there. So it's good. It says here, remember that you being in time past, what were you before? All right. We were Gentiles in the flesh, all right, because we had not been yet put into Christ, who were called uncircumcision. All right, if you remember when God called Abraham and God made a covenant of promise with him, he said, any that belong to you uh, that are going to be my children because of you, all right, there has to be an outward sign. and they had to do circumcision, the cutting away of that foreskin, the flesh of the foreskin. It was an outward sign that they belonged to God. And the Gentiles did not have that. Muslims had it because Ishmael um, was a son of Abraham. And of course, he was uh, circumcised. So those under the Muslim religion that are uh, the offspring of Ishmael, they learned that when they were still under Abraham, all right? But other than that, there are no religions, there are no peoples, all right, uh, who are circumcised. So it says, you were Gentiles in the flesh, you were called uncircumcision, by the circumcision. The circumcision were those children of Abraham that claimed they were God's children, all right, because they had this circumcision done uh, by hand, all right. Verse 12, at that time, all right, when you were uncircumcised, it says you were without Christ. Actually, friends, I want to tell you from this portion of scripture that we're going to study right now, there's only two positions before God. You're either in Christ or you're outside of Christ. You're without Christ. There's no other. It, it, it isn't, are you a Singaporean? <clears throat> are you a Japanese? Are you an Englishman? Are you an American? Are you Ukrainian? Are you, no, that doesn't even enter into it. What race are you? It doesn't enter into it. How much education do you have? It doesn't enter into it. There are two positions. You are either in Christ or you're without Christ. All right. And it says, if you remember in those days, you were without Christ. And actually, I just broke down these things that I, I got them from the book. All right. It said no spiritual blessings. All right. Of course, in the book, it came out of the Bible, all right? No spiritual blessings, no light, no peace, no rest, no safety, no hope, all right? Had no prophet who was God's spokesman, no priest who was an intermediary between God and us, no king to rule over us, fight our battles for us, all right? Without Christ, it tells us clearly we were aliens, all right? That means we were cut off from any promises. 
We were non-participants. We were strangers as far as the covenants, the promises that God made. We had no hope. Hope is always the future, all right? The future was hopeless. It didn't matter how rich you became. Your ultimate end is there's no hope. Um, on Sunday, when I preached for the Myanmar, I told this story of Maureen's father, all right, who was a Buddhist. And we were just starting our church. There was only our own family. So if we wanted to win people, you had to go out there and knock on doors, stand on the corner, stop people, witness to them, talk to them, because people didn't know about our little house church. They weren't going to come in. And if they did come in and only saw our family, they would think that, oh, I better not intrude in on this. All right. So I went door to door knocking. And when I came to this man's house and he opened the door, as soon as I saw him, I knew he didn't speak English. This was 60 over years ago. All right. And just by the way he dressed, uh, he looked like a fisherman, all right, but dark blue clothes, a samfu. I, I knew he didn't speak English, so I spoke Mandarin, but actually he was Teochu. He didn't speak Mandarin either, but he could understand my Mandarin. And when I told him I'm here to tell you about Jesus, he just, you know, before that he was smiling, very courteous and nice. But the minute I said, I'm here to tell you about Jesus, he, his face changed. And he's, you know, he said, I am a Buddhist and my mother and father are Buddhists and my grandparents were Buddhists. And what Zhu 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 Zhong Zhi Dao Zhong Guo Dou Shi Xin Fo Jiao. My ancestors clear back into China were Buddhists and he said, I'm going to be a Buddhist till I die. And he just slammed the door in my face. I, I mean, I was really, I was young, quite easily offended. And I, I just remember thinking, whoa, you're never going to get to heaven. <laughs> I just walked off. I was really uptight and offended by him. But I didn't know the goodness of God and the greatness of God. And I didn't know that one of our first converts was his daughter. I didn't know there was any relationship between her and him. So she got born again. And when she tried to let him know, oh, my goodness, he beat her. He beat her. He forbid her to come to church. She still came. You know, but every time he found out, he would beat her. One day, her name was Maureen, and one day she came to me and she said, Sister, my father is in the hospital. Of course, I didn't know who her father was, um, and uh, they don't expect him to live. Uh, they think he's going to die. Uh, he doesn't know Jesus. She didn't tell me he beat her. He, she didn't tell me any of that. She said, he doesn't speak English. Would you visit him in the hospital? Take your Chinese Bible because he doesn't understand English. So I said, yes. Uh, and I went to the hospital to visit him. He was in a ward. And when I walked through the door of the ward, there were many beds. And I was looking for his number, the bed number she had given me. And the moment I saw him, and the moment he saw me, our eyes met, all right? When I got close to him, he said, I am a Buddhist. I said, I remember. I'm telling you, he, he did not want to hear about Jesus. But every week I went, every week I went, uh, as long as I would just talk small talk, you know, have you eaten? You know, that small talk, have you slept? Have you eaten? Um, how are you today? He, he, he would talk and smile. But the minute I was 
say, Jesus, I want to tell you about, no, I am a Buddhist. So, you know, after about a month, for the second time, I gave him up. All right. I told my husband, I'm wasting my time on this man. He doesn't want the Lord. There's no point in me trying to shove him down his throat. And I stopped going. So for the second time, I was as good as saying there's no hope for him. All right. She came to me after a few weeks and said, my father's asking where is that white lady? Why doesn't she come anymore? I felt smitten. And she said, they think he might even die today. He's vomiting blood and they've pulled the curtains around his bed. So I went again. I asked God to forgive me that for the second time, I kind of wrote him off because of his behavior. See, God's love never does that he never writes us off it's only when there's no the day of grace is past that's a different thing then it won't be god as a god of love it will be god in his wrath meeting people who have spurned him don't want him and over and over turn their back on him and finally there's no more time left all right, until then, he will love us to the very end. All right. And so when I got there, and I had had to climb stairs to get to his floor. And I remember, though I was young, I was a bit panting and out of breath. And when I walked in those, you know, pulled the curtains and walked, there he was up against pillows he had a white thing over him and you could tell he'd been vomiting it was full of blood it was splattered all over he was so weak and when he looked at me he said you know i'm a buddhist in very small voice and, and i just my heart went to my toes i remember thinking this man is the hardest man i've ever met he's dying and he's still, I'm a Buddhist, but he didn't stop there. He said to me, you know, I, I, I'm a Buddhist, but now I'm facing death. And somehow my gods, he was more than a Buddhist. Uh, he must have been a Taoist because he had different idols. He, he said, my gods can't help me. And I'm very frightened. He said, can your Jesus help me? And I said, yes, he can. My Jesus can help you. I said, follow me in this prayer. You see, I didn't immediately start preaching to him. Open up the Bible, preach. He was so close to dying. Halfway through, you know, he could have mati, died and never got to heaven. He didn't have Jesus. I, there was no time to preach the gospel to him. I, it says, whosoever calleth, calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whosoever knows the full story of salvation, whosoever understands the Bible, whosoever knows everything about the Bible. No, no, no. You, all you have to do is call. And that's, I, I, I knew that's what we had to do. So I just said to him, follow me in this prayer. And I led him in a prayer, sentence by sentence. All right. I said it in Mandarin, but he said it in his Teochew. You know, I got to the place where I confess. I said, I am a sinner. I cannot help myself. Please come into my heart. Then I stopped to take, take some breath, some air. All right. And of course, my eyes were closed. I'd always been taught when you pray, you close your eyes. And I, I realized he didn't stop. His voice kept on. So my eyes opened and I looked at him and his two frail hands were lifted up toward heaven. And the tears were running down his cheeks. And I heard him say, oh, thank you, God. 
now I am your son. Hello? I never ever got a chance to tell him if you accept Jesus, you will become a son of God. He never would let his daughter tell him. Where in the world did he learn that from? But I tell you, the moment he invited Jesus into his heart, like that, he was born again. He was a new creature. And that new creation knew that he was a son of God. I, I'm here to tell you, friends, uh, he didn't die that night. In fact, he lived for almost a month after that. And during that time, he got his, he had two wives. His first wife, he had sons that were like 30 years old. Uh, and uh, when his eldest son came, he told that eldest son, he said, I want you to go home and take all these, my idols and get rid of them. They've never helped me. I, am, I believe in Jesus. And when I die, I am a Christian. And I want you to make sure you bury me as a Christian because Jesus has come into my heart. And I know I'm a child of God. I, I tell you, friends, it's a marvelous thing when we're, that's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Oh, when we're outside of Christ, we're strangers, we're alienate, we're aliens, we're alienated, all right? We, we don't have hope. We don't have God in this world. But the moment that we're in Christ, oh, we have everything. All, it says, he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. Isn't that marvelous? Jesus is the light. So when we accept Christ, we have the light of the world in us and it opens our spiritual eyes. We're no longer spiritually blind. Now suddenly we're, we realize there is a God. There is a uh, somebody that loves me, that helps me, so forth. There's peace, there's rest. Everything we didn't have before in Christ, we have it now. Amen. Um, just a here. So I think this is a good place to stop. We'll start with verse th 13 when we come back, because we've talked about being without Christ. And then when we start on verse 13, we're going to talk about what it's like being in Christ. All right. So come back at um, 1006. Thank you. Okay. We're uh, on Ephesians chapter two, and in this book, Explore the Book, uh, we're really on page 173, okay? So, we're gonna start with verse 13. Yeah, 13 yes. and 14. Okay. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Okay, do 15 and 16. Okay. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Okay. <clears throat> so... We're going to see now, but now in Christ, we talked about remember <clears throat> what it was like and what we didn't have when we were in um, the flesh, all right, when we were without Christ. 
but now we're going to talk about what we have in Christ, all right? In Christ, sometimes you were far off, are now made nigh by the blood of Jesus. That This speaks of distance, all right? And if we see the second paragraph on page 173, all right, verses 13 to 18, uh, he says, uh, the five big barriers between Jew and Gentile have been swept away, all right? The first thing is he destroyed distance, all right? Those that were far off are made nigh. And really, when people are in sin and have never known the Lord, never been in Christ, um, it's like, where is God? Where is God? They're far, far away because they're, they belong to a different kingdom. They belong to the kingdom of darkness. They're under a different ruler. Uh, they're under the hand of the enemy who is always ready to blind us and deceive us and uh, torment us. And it, it's like, and make us believe bad about God. All right. So the second thing he destroyed is uh, disunity. It says he is our peace who has made both one, the Jew and the Gentile. So there's unity now. All right. We're both one, no longer disunity. All right. So the second thing that's been destroyed or barriers is the disunity. And the third thing is division, all right? In verse 15, says that middle wall of partition, that wall that divided us, I'm a Jew, I'm a Gentile, that's gone, all right? So distance is gone, disunion is gone, division is gone, dissension is gone. That's the fourth thing. He has destroyed dissension because it says he abolished enmity, the enmity, so making peace, all right? And five, he has destroyed all distinction because verse 15 says he makes of the twain, both Jew and Gentile, he made us one man. So there's these five barriers, distance, disunion, division, dissension, and distinction that is not in christ let me tell you friends it doesn't matter when you're in the body of christ and you you know you you say oh we want to have our own class because we're all lawyers and they're street cleaners you're, you're not in christ you're not talking about being in christ you're still thinking in the flesh because in Christ, all these barriers are gone, whether it's between the Jew and the Gentile or whether it's amongst people themselves, you know, distinctions. And uh, I, I, I can't, I don't want to be near them. They live in a smaller house than what I live. Uh, I'm educated. They're not educated. No, 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 no. In Christ, all of that is done away with. We're all one in Christ, all right? And if we still hang on to these things, distance, disunion, division, dissension, distinction, wanting to be different, wanting to have a distinction made, I'm somebody special. No, nobody is more special than anybody else. In Christ, we're all equal, we're all one. We're all building the body of Christ, all right? So um, he says in verse 16, all right, he abolished in his flesh the enmity, that's 15. Uh, when he died on the cross, all right, the enmity was gone, all right? He, he paid the price of all of that, all right? Um, and he said, because he was making everyone one, equal unity, all right? And he made peace. So there's peace between them. 
no matter what strata, no matter what status, it, it doesn't matter, all right? That he might reconcile both unto God at the same time, Jew or Gentile, that they might be reconciled, means to put your hand back in the hand of God. Once again, to be united with God. No more barriers, no more uh, anger, no more, you know, falling away. All right. But once again, join to the Lord. All right. Um, where am I? 16. By the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Verse 17 and 18. Okay. Would you read it, please? Yes, Sister Sue. And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Okay, let's go on and read 19 and 20. Okay. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Yeah, so praise the Lord. We're no longer second class. We're no longer looked down upon as, the, you know, they, the Jews used to call Gentiles dogs. In other words, they had no place in God's kingdom, as far as they were concerned. If you wanted to belong to God, you had to become a Jew. They called him a proselyte. You had to become a Jew, then only you could even think of belonging to God. But no, through Jesus, everything has been changed. Even Jews, all right, they're outside of God if they're not in Christ, because it's not the outward that counts. It's what has happened spiritually and when jesus came it says through uh he came that 17 preach peace to us whenever it talks about being afar off it's talking about what we used to be gentiles compared to jews who were the offspring of uh abraham all right um and to those who were nigh because the the jews had heard of God. The Jews claimed to be the children of God, but the Lord is letting us know that there's only one way really to be his children, all right, and that is to be in Christ, all right, and believing what God says. So it says through him, through Jesus, we both have access to the Father. He is our heavenly father, and it's by one spirit, the spirit of the living God, who has to do with our salvation. Now, when I say by one spirit, it's not just the baptism of the spirit. Before we're baptized into the spirit, it took God's spirit to uh, enable salvation to take place. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. But when he wants to empower us, then he comes into us and through us flows his um, miracle working power. Amen. So it says here um, in 19, you're no more strangers, all right, to the promises of God. Uh, strangers that have no right. Okay. I am a, a permanent resident here in Singapore. I have been for over 60 years. I have a, you know, a PR. But there are still privileges that citizens have that PRs don't have. We, we have privileges as a PR compared to other people who don't have PRs. We definitely have privileges but we don't have the privileges that citizens have, all right, here in Singapore. So if you'll try to think of it like 
in that way, all right? We're, before we were strangers, we didn't have a right to claim the salvation. We didn't have a right to claim the promises of God. We didn't have a right to claim the covenants of God. We didn't have a right to claim all the benefits that God had and wanted to provide. We didn't have a right to it. But now that we are in Christ, we are citizens. Amen. We are fellow citizens with the saints. We're not second rate, second class citizens. Amen. All right. Uh, and of the household of God, we actually belong to the family of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We're not slaves. We're not, you know, uh, a, a second class. We're not that. We have to recognize we're totally sons and daughters with the rights of a son and a daughter. I, I remember how many times I've read stories of, uh, you know, people who are high up in the world, all right, they're like, the king of an empire, so to speak, that they, they, they're really, and no, you, you can't get in there without a, um, either an invitation or you have to have in advance, you have to make your, your, I can't remember the word right now, appointment. You have to make an appointment. And if they don't give you an appointment, there's no way you're going to get to see that person because they're way up there. All right. And yet their little child uh, will come running in sometimes when the father is in conference, you know, and, and people, no, no, no. You, yes, he's my daddy. And they just come barging in. And if, if it's a good father, they, they will always make room for that little child. They won't say, listen, they told you you shouldn't come in. How come? They won't get scolded. That's why we're told that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Amen. He's now a different relationship. He's not that. He is that almighty God. We should have that awe in our hearts toward him. But it's a different level when he's our father. It brings it down to an intimate level. It's not just, oh, you know, I wish I could be near. No, we can climb up on his lap. We can sit there on his lap. We can hug him. He'll hug us. Uh, it's a very intimate relationship that we have with him now as we are of the household of God. And now it's talking about being built, all right? Uh, a building, all right? This building has to have a foundation. We're part of that building and there's only one foundation, all right? Here, it's the teachings of the apostles. That's the New Testament. And the prophets are the Old Testament, God's word. But Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. That means everything. He was laid first, and then it's built around him, and he gives balance to it and um, so forth. All right, so it's Jesus Christ. Actually, he is our foundation, Jesus, all right? But he taught the disciples. God taught the prophets through his spirit and it's through their teachings it's through god's word that we learn to find it but the most important one of that whole foundation is jesus christ the chief cornerstone in whom all right not looking at him okay he's my no 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 i'm in him in whom verse 21 oops would you read that sister 21 and 22. Okay. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Okay. So in Christ, all right, everything 
is put together. That's uh, no matter who comes into Christ, uh, we're all for the same reason. We grow fitly framed together. All right, grow us. So it's talking about a living building. It's not just talking about bricks and stones that are dead. We are living stones that groweth. You know, there's there's a growing, there's a maturing, there's a developing of life, all right, unto a holy temple. What is a temple for? A temple is a place to worship and magnify and praise God, to pray to God. We are the temple of the living God. I have used that many times in my prayer. When Satan is trying to do something, I'll say, you take your hands off of me. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You have no right to touch me, to use me. I'm to worship God. I'm to praise God. I'm to be a house of prayer. Amen. And we, we need to, don't just read this at the side. Let, let's understand its meaning and then apply it to our lives in whom you are also builded together. All right. You're not just one person, you and God, and God is just working with you. No, it says we are builded together. That's why, you know, now that the thing is off, that this uh, stay at home church was closed down for how long and it was only online some people finally found it so convenient online they've never gone back to a meeting together but i'm here to tell you there's something about meeting together and this says in whom you are also builded together it's all of us together for a habitation. God is living in us. God is living in the midst of us, not just me alone, not just you alone, but us, because we are one in him. And it is through the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, um, On this 173 at the very end there, you'll see 19 to 22. 19 comes as a further break marked by the words, now therefore you are, all right? There's a contrast between what we were and what we now are uh, is consummated. Our new relationship is set forth in five striking particulars. We, we had those five barriers that were broken in the paragraph above. Now we have, all right, um, five of these new things, all right? First, we're all fellow citizens of one heavenly city. Second, we are all members of one heavenly household, the family of God. Third, we are built on one imperishable foundation, all right? Fourth, which is the word of God and Jesus Christ, the word of God in the Old Testament, the word of God in the New Testament, all right? Both. No, don't just chuck the old out because the old was a foundation for the new to be built on, even though the new makes it more clear, sometimes the old, uh, because of the stories that are told, we can see it in story form. We understand truths even more than when it's just talked about. So we need both old and new, all right? Um, fourth, we are all living stones in the one spiritual building, all right? We have a part to play. Fifth, we are all indwelt by one renewing spirit. So now when you turn the page, you're going to come to 174. He's got it very well put into like a, 
just to see it instead of seeing whole, you know, words, words, and we have to underline the words he has done here. Let's go through this. The old relationship, all right? That's verses 11 to 12. We were without Christ. We were aliens. We were strangers, having no hope without God. In the new relationship, all right? Now, therefore, you are, 19 to 22, citizens of one city, members of one family, built on the one foundation, parts of one building, indwelt by the one spirit, all right? How the change was wrought. How did this change come about? But now in Christ Jesus, 13 to 18, distance was done away. You are made nigh. Disunion done away. He hath made both one. Division done away. Broken that middle wall. Dissension done away. He abolished the enmity. That's why, friend, you, you know, I find it very difficult to understand how people can think they are in Christ and they're still saying about somebody, I just don't like them. And if they sit on this side, I'm sitting over on that other side. I am not going to shake their head. Hello? Do you know what it's all about at all? Do you really know who you are in Christ and that they're part of you? There can be, you don't hate yourself. You don't hate part of what is yourself. People who do that are mentally unsound. When they take knives and they cut themselves and try to hurt themselves physically, we know they're mentally unsound. And when we do that in the realm of the spirit, we do not understand at all what it means to be in Christ. We're still very self-centered and going by earthly conduct and earthly thoughts, all right? So it says the distinction is done away because of twain, of two, both the Jew and the Gentile or two different Gentile people or two different Jewish people, all right? We are one new man. Both Jew and Gentile now are reconciled to God, reconciled both to God, have peace with God, peace to you and peace to them, have access to God. We both have access, all right? Um, well, we have, I never dreamt we would get through this much. So we're gonna start on uh, the third chapter. We might do reviewing next week, that's all right, but let's go over to, Ephesians chapter three. Um, actually, here the revealing of the divine mystery, he's got it clear from verse one to verse 12. Let, let's, um, Right now, let's just read verse nine verses, all right? And then I'm going to start talking about them. Okay. So Ephesians 3, read from verse one to nine. Yes. Okay. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow, fellow ears and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ 
Oh, I okay. I think we'll stop with six. All right. Okay. Um, let's go back to verse one. For this cause, all right, uh, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, all right? What he's saying there is he was in prison in Rome, all right? But he doesn't see himself as a prisoner of Rome. He refuses to see himself as anything but connected to Jesus. I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Jesus has allowed this. It's for his name. It's for his glory. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm not really under the hand of the Romans, even though he was killed, physically killed. But he refused to see himself as part of this world. Anything that happened to him, he saw it, even to this being an in prison, he said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. In other words, because I'm preaching to you Gentiles, because I believe God wants you to know about him. The Jews got angry and I had to appeal. And after appealing, you know, I, I was, well, it's a long story. You, you have to go read the book of Acts to see it all. All right. How he was already caught by and they, they were going to kill him they were going to kill him and um the jews that is and this this centurion came and took him away from them all right and he became a prisoner of rome but had he not been preaching to the gentiles trying to win the gentiles the jews who were like in a frenzy because they didn't believe Gentiles deserved to come to God. We've just finished reading what a new thing it is, what God has done for us. But this one that tells us, he's saying, you know, I want you to realize if you've ever heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, all right, there's been different dispensations. And the first was the first uh, innocence. And, and then uh, about the patriarchs and the law. And there's different times where God used different ways to teach people and bring them up in, in the knowledge. And you and I in the church age, we're in the dispensation of grace, all right? Where we can know God and learn to love him and find out about the love of God and, and that we have a place with God. He says, God gave me this knowledge, all right, by revelation. Something that in the past they didn't understand, they didn't know, but God revealed it to me, all right? So he says, you can understand, how come I know? God opened the eyes of my spiritual understanding and showed me very clearly, which in verse five, which in other ages was not made known. They didn't know this. People thought it was on the Jews, of course, <laughs> thought they were the only ones that could come to God because they were the children of Abraham. Of course, they didn't even believe that the children of Ishmael could come to God because they were from the promised one. Isaac was the one that has been promised, all right? And therefore, they came from that offspring. But what they didn't understand is they didn't understand about being born again at all because you know that the religious leaders were the teachers of the law, and yet they didn't want what God had sent his only son. They rejected him because of jealousy and so forth. So until we're born again, we can be religious uh, fanatics, but religion will never save us, all right? And that's what he's saying here 
in the ages to come, I mean, the ages of the past, all right, um, they didn't understand any of this, all right? But it was revealed to the holy apostles and the prophets in the Old Testament. It tells, it tells of all this, even Isaiah 53, which by the way, uh, the Jews, all right, in the Jewish synagogues, they never want to read that chapter. They don't want people to read chapter 53. Why? Because it is so clear about the Savior. It explains things so clearly that uh, about the Messiah. And because history has already gone by, we look and see that it, there can be nobody else but Jesus that that whole chapter is talking about, all right? Before history came forth, uh, they didn't know who the Messiah would be, but that chapter unfolds very, very clearly just by looking at the past, all right? So it says, what is this mystery that it was told in the Old Testament, the apostles preached it, all right, but verse six, that the Gentiles, all right, you and I who have been afar off at a distance from God, we were never the chosen ones. And it looked like we would never have a chance uh, to come. But actually God's plan was the Gentiles would be fellow heirs. All right. We would inherit along with the others. All right. We would be of that same body, the body of Christ we would be partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, all right, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it wasn't known before, but now this mystery has been revealed so clearly and carefully. And verse, uh, read seven, eight, and nine, will you? Sister, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was on mute. Seven, eight, and nine. Read it for us. Yes. Where, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. All right. So we see here that he, he says it was because of grace that he was made a minister. All right. The gift of the grace of God was given to Paul. All right, we all know that story of his uh, going from Damascus, I mean, from Jerusalem to Damascus. He was a zealot, all right? He was just uh, so fervent in his belief. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, and he really believed what he was doing was for God's sake, but it was because he was spiritually blind. He didn't realize that he was actually fighting against God when he fought against the Christians. He got permission from the religious rulers to go to Damascus and anybody in Damascus that believed in Jesus and preached Jesus or, you know, followed the religion of this uh, name of Jesus that he could take them and imprison them. He even had soldiers, Roman soldiers to go along with him to help him do the arresting. And halfway there, all right, that bright light from heaven shone like lightning, you know, when light, and the lightning comes like that. It, it's just almost can blind your eyes. 
But this did that. It not only blinded his eyes, it was like a thunderbolt with the lightning. It struck him and he fell off his horse. The soldiers fell off their horses. They were flat on the ground. He couldn't see for three days and three nights, all right, because of that bright light. And he realized this was not just a thunderbolt, a lightning bolt. He, he knew it was a spiritual thing. And when he was lying on the ground, he said, Lord, he used that word, Lord, Master, who are you? Who are you? And Jesus answered, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus, after resurrecting, of course, Paul didn't believe Jesus resurrected. They told the story that the disciples took his body away and bluffed that he was resurrected. The soldiers who saw what happened and how that, you know, tombstone was tomb, and they saw Jesus come out of the tomb and they went to tell the, the chief priests, all right, because they, they were paid to keep, make sure nobody opened that tomb. So they went to tell what they had seen and they were paid off, said, look, at, you, don't tell anybody what you saw. We'll give you this amount of money. And it must have been enough money that they were satisfied not to tell what they had seen and to tell a lie. Uh, that no wonder the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon, the God of money, things, money speaks, money can sway judgment, money can change judgment, money can change people's minds. You, if you accept God, you cannot love money and what money can buy. You got to make up your mind which is going to rule and reign in your life. Is it going to be God or is it going to be money? All right. And yet many Christians today, they let money decide things that, no, if, if it's God, money means nothing to God. All the silver and the gold belongs to him. All the power belongs to him. All things belong to him. And if we only realize that, we will not let money sway us away from the truth of God. Nevertheless, <clears throat> he didn't believe in Jesus. But after this encounter, when Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. You notice his name was Saul then. You notice he didn't say, prove, prove it to me that you're Jesus. No, he knew it. And Jesus spoke to him. He accepted it. And immediately he responded, Lord, now, now the first Lord, who are you? I don't know who you are. Then Jesus said, I am Jesus. And when you persecute my children, you're persecuting me. Immediately when Jesus told him, I am Jesus, he called him, Lord, what will thou have me to do? In a split second, he said, I'm your servant. I'm your slave. Just tell me what you want. And, and his whole um, thinking, his whole doctrine changed in that moment of time all right friends i'm here to tell you you must be born again otherwise you're spiritually blind religion can never do it and it couldn't do it for paul and from that moment after he accepted him he was you know in fact god gave him a vision well, he was blind. Three days, that light of Jesus blinded his natural eyes. He couldn't see anything. He fasted water and food for three days. 
people had to lead him by the hand to get to Damascus. And when he was in Damascus and, and wherever he stayed, he never ate or anything. He just waited upon God, now knowing that Jesus was the son of God. And, and Jesus showed him a man by the name of Ananias is going to come and uh, tell you about me. He will lay hands on you. You will be able to see. And he's also going to baptize you in water. He told him everything. So when then God spoke to Ananias and told him where to go and the name of the person, Ananias was horrified. Lord, I've heard by so many people about this man. He punishes them. He imprisons them. And the Lord said, you go and do what I told you to do. He, I have chosen him. I have chosen him. And I've even given him a vision to see a man by the name of Ananias coming in. And we know that Ananias believed Jesus and the vision he was shown and what God spoke to him. Because when he got to Saul, he said, he called him brother, brother salt. He accepted him as a fellow member of the body of Christ. He didn't just say, woo, I, I got to really be careful. I hope that I, you know, no, he believed what God said, accepted him at face value, prayed over him to see and immediately all right, the scales fell off his eyes. He was baptized in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, even though it didn't tell us at that time, all right, in the story. We know because Paul himself said, I speak in tongues more than you all. So he not only was baptized in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he was baptized into the Holy Spirit because he was able to speak in tongues, just like God gave on the day of Pentecost and God gave to the uh, Corinthian, no, the, oh, the Gentile centurion, all right, um, when the Gentiles came to the Lord and Peter went there and prayed for them, they also were baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, for we heard them speak with other tongues. All right, now let's go back here again. I'm going to close now. All right, it says, unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Why does he say that? Because he used to persecute them. Because he himself said, I even caused them to blaspheme God. Some of them who weren't strong in faith finally turned their back on God because of the pressure that I put. So he said, I am really less than the least of all saints. I don't deserve any of this, but the grace God's life, God's power, God's wisdom, God's know-how, which is his grace, was given me that I should preach among the Gentiles. Even though Peter was the first one that was used to minister to the Gentiles, Paul was given the ministry of going here and there uh, to the Gentiles, all right? to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, and I've said that before. We can never know everything there is to know. He always has something new and fresh. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I want you just to, in your own heart, answer my question. How many of us that know the Lord and have read the Bible more than once, over and over. Every year I go through the Bible at, at least one time, the Old Testament, and maybe 
the New Testament two times. Other people read a lot more than that. But um, for me, I do that and I have for many years. And yet I will come across things. I never, I've read it. I know it's there in the Bible, but I never understood it. And then suddenly, whoop, he shows me what it means. And I just, I'm just amazed. God, all these years of reading it, and now you're showing me this. Wow, it's unbelievable. You know, there's through the ages to come, my friends, he's going to be showing us the riches of his grace when he made Jesus real to us, when he created us new creatures in Christ. All right. Thank you, Jesus. It says, verse nine, I'm going to end with that, to make all men see, not just certain people, not just Christians alone, not just Jews alone, but all men see. All right. What is the fellowship of that mystery? Everybody needs to know that in God's plan and God's desire, everybody should have a part. If we don't have a part, it's because we turn it down. It's because we don't want it. It's because we want something more than that. All right. But if God has his way, all people need to see what the fellowship of the mystery from the beginning, all right, is to be able to be in Christ, part of Christ, and thereby belonging to God and a member of the household of God. God wants everyone to know it and hear it and understand, preferably. But if we don't, it's because we turn it down because we would rather believe what we've read. We'd rather believe what people told us. We'd rather believe what we've always believed. I don't wanna believe that because if I believe that, I, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do the other. No, 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 no. I don't wanna believe that as if it's our choice. You can choose whatever you want to believe, but there's only one true faith and that connects us to God, it's Jesus and his shed blood, and that he not only died for us, but he arose from the dead. He defeated Satan, all right, and he overcame. It says he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, and he is coming back for those that believe, that look for him, that desire him. He is coming back again for us. We'll see you next week um, as we pick up here. We'll probably go back and do a little reviewing, but we will be starting on verse 10 as our first verse. God bless each of you. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Lord, as we read this, that you showed Paul that you wanted his preaching to make all men see. It's not just for certain people, certain privileged people, certain educated people. It's for everyone. Oh, that their spiritual eyes would be opened, that the light of Jesus Christ would shine on them, that the word of God would speak into their heart that he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in Jesus should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, that all might see it, that all might hear it, that all might receive it and know it, Lord. I pray if there's anyone in this group today that is religious but not born again, maybe they've gone to church all their life, but they have never 
really been totally changed into a brand new creature. Speak to hearts today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because your desire is that nobody should perish, but everybody should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and become a witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you on Thursday, hopefully, for Song of Solomon. Amen.